he's the shove it man. Oh, he's the shove it man. He's gonna shove it. Yeah. He's gonna shove it. Man. It's the Hawk here. I'm taking a minor risk today and we're going back to watching NWA TNA. I was really enjoying it, and the chance to make skits about everything makes it even better. I know everybody loves Ring of the Hawk, but if we make it every single video it'll be overkill. There's something called too much of a good thing, and less is more, and your mums are- <coughs> Moving on. Just like when I flew out of her window the other night, I fell out of the sky from a great height. I broke a few feathers, but overall I'm alright. Make sure you follow me on the gram and the twitter in case we ever need to fight. Alright, let's make the girls play, it's TNA and the NWA. Last time on TNA we got two ladder matches. The X Division action was completely insane and X-Pac is now the X Division champion. Completely undeserved I might add. He didn't even properly compete in the ladder match, he just turned up at the end of it. Truth is still the world champion but he's not really the focus of the show. The X Division is. Also nothing really funny happened. It's fine, I'll make it funny. Either I will or Brian Lawler will, I promise. The show starts with Jorge who now randomly has a manager called Priscilla. I give it a week. He also says he'll be looking to add a new Flying Elvis tonight. Brian Lawler walks up to Goldilocks gritting his teeth and spitting all over her. Goldilocks asks where his girlfriend is. Then Jorge continues speaking and Lawler's girlfriend is hiding in the door behind them. Wait, is Pac in there too? So something else was happening. Our opening match today features cab driver David Young versus Brian Lawler. Lawler has an extra big pendant on today but it looks like a piece of trash. It looks like a piece of screwed up tinfoil. His girlfriend then appears. Lawler's completely losing it as usual. He crashes into someone at ringside. Lawler's gimmick is that he's a dancing schizophrenic. To my knowledge, this is the only time this has ever happened in wrestling. Lawler gets sent to the outside of the ring and he tries to get a testosterone boost. Then he comes back into the ring but falls over. What a goofball. Lawler hits a full Nelson face buster, but he's way too distracted and can't put Young away. Then he randomly abuses the referee. He's one of the most unhinged wrestlers I've ever seen. Young keeps hitting DDTs, but Lawler's no-selling it because he hasn't got anything in his head anyway to damage. David Young misses the cab driver assault. This gives Lawler the chance to fly, but he also misses. David wants to hit the cab driver assault so badly, but he's distracted by Lawler's girlfriend waving at him from the ringside. Lawler then hits the reverse DDT and it's over. Not one of the best matches I've ever seen. Lawler pulls her hair and sends her to the back. Next up, Jerry Lynn limps out to the ring. He's not in a very good mood because he was attacked and sent to hospital and stripped of his X Division title, all in the same night. Lynn threatens Sonny, don't look at my ass Yaki for attacking him and said that they'll fight next week. Not a bad promo actually. Don't look at it then comes out and looks like he's been rolling in olive oil. He calls Lynn goofy and makes fun of him for being a mid carder for his whole career. He proceeds to say his own name six times, then Lynn threatens him so Ass takes him out. What was he expecting? Some jobbers try to make the save, but he pretty much beats them up. Oh look, it's Norman Smiley. Lynn is determined to have a fight, but there's just too many guys in the way. The half man, half mold then crashes down the ramp to try and restore some order. Everyone pretty much hates Sonny Siaki. He seems to be a main character at the moment, which is pretty cool. Next up, it's a boring interview. It's Mike Tanay speaking to X Pac. Mike Tanay kisses his ass and tells him what a big fan he is. Pac tries to explain what the X Division's about, but he struggles. He says that the X stands for extreme. Pac says that no one will ever be able to recreate DX or the NWO. TNA obviously didn't get the memo on that one. Don't look at my asses out next. The stripper really enjoys dancing to his theme music. Talking of theme music, the best song in the history of wrestling hits. If you haven't done so already, make sure you join the Hawks Fly Into Graceland tour as I chase 100k subs. Jorge is a man on a mission and tries to win with a moonsault. Siaki isn't a fan and throws him out of the ring of a belly to belly. Then out of nowhere, Sonny Siaki hits a reverse overhead pump handle suplex on the outside. It barely does anything. They continue fighting in the ring. Jorge hits a diving tornado DDT from the middle ropes. It's not looking good for Sonny as Jorge hits the trip to Graceland followed by a lion salt for a two count. It's then nearly game over as Siaki hits a clothesline. It's hard to see which way this one's going. Then, pretty much against the run of play, he hits the Siakalips now for the free. For some reason, he has two completely different moves, but they've both been called the Siakalips now. I'm not making this up, I pay attention alright. Jerry Lynn then attacks him again after the match. I'm getting major deja vu here. It's over. Now we have another match. It's Derek Wilde who looks like a child. He's going to be taking on Ace Steel with an albino Harry Potter as his manager. I can see he's been snorting a whole tray of drugs before this match. 
Derek Wilde has the better of Ace Steel, then he tries a bad looking move with his legs to send Steel to the outside. The gymnastics continue as Wilde hits a hurricanrana on the outside. Apparently the albino Harry Potter is determined to take over the X Division and was trying to sign people for quarter of a million. Yeah, like this guy has that much money. Why would he be that determined? It doesn't even make sense. What's in it for him if he signs an X Division wrestler? Ace still nails the superplex. Then he's really struggling to apply some sort of gory special manoeuvre. I can do this man, I don't care how many drugs I've done, I can beat this man with my finisher man. And it's over, a pretty bad match. I don't ever want to see these guys again after this one. When I'm watching a boring show, my mind starts to wander. At this point, I was wondering if these cage dancers ever get tired of dancing to the exact same song every week. For God's sake, give them something different. 90% of you watching right now are straight, but there's 10% of you watching right now that might not be. And that's okay, because you're all together watching the Hawk talk. It's Miss TNA, Bruce. Then suddenly, a wild slap nuts appears. Double J, Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> he will be teaming up with Bruce. What a great team we have here. The best friends will be taking on the team of BG James and Hermie Sadler. This match came about last week because everybody was making fun of Hermie's driving abilities. James gets the mic and says welcome to the baby boy's playpen. It doesn't sound as catchy. Mold Dog talks about what a great driver Hermie is. Then Slapnuts gets the mic and starts talking about race car driving again. He says that some Hollywood directors were watching Hermes' last race and they've decided to cast him in a film, The Last and the Furious. There's a huge blurred out sign at the front of the crowd. I'm sorry, I can't do much about it. In fact, why am I apologising? I think it says that Hermie blows engines and Bruce blows something else. Hermie actually gets in the ring against Bruce and he gets the better of him. They then try some comedy spots. Mold Dog wants to kick Bruce in the nutsack, but he can't find anything to kick. BG then wants to hit the pump handle, but Bruce seems to like it. Hermes' cars suck gas. I wish this match would pass, because Bruce sucks at wrestling. <laughs> Hermie hits a suplex on Bruce. He also hits a back body drop and almost gets the free. Then Brian Lawler hits BG with a trash can. Bruce is distracted by everyone fighting. Then something weird happens and Hermie Sadler somehow comes out the winner. One of the worst matches I've ever seen. Bruce tries to hug Jarrett after the match so he kicks him square in the nutsack and gives him the stroke. This guy is the ultimate tweener. Another match now, it's Norman Smiley in his second TNA match versus the Nazi boy. Wow, this episode of TNA is so bad. We haven't seen Smiley since he was choked out by Truth and saved by his wife in a weird angle. The Nazi is in a terrible mood as usual. He hits a big boot and then he tosses Smiley to the outside of the floor and then he throws Smiley back in the ring again. So what was the point? The commentary team are talking about how the Nazi never smiles even if he wins. Well that bit's easy to explain because he never wins. Smiley hits a lovely wind up slam. He then follows it up with a big wiggle whilst the Nazi boy shakes with anger. This one's going a bit longer than expected. The Nazi gets a two on a side slam. Then he hits a bad looking full Nelson slam, if that's what it was supposed to be. And then the Nazi wins. His first win in TNA. A real day of celebration. It's episode 17 of TNA. After the match he tries to beat Smiley up more. And then he gets his ass handed to him. The other Nazi makes the save for his brother. Then the two big bold boys start shoving each other but nothing happens. The only two guys in wrestling more dislikable than slap nuts. Let me know if I'm wrong. Next up. Rick and Chris Michaels will be challenging for the tag titles because I guess TNA was desperate on this episode. The champions are Storm and Harris. Look at those cute cap guns. I can't believe this is still going on in episode 17. Storm and Harris are the only people on the roster who are undefeated. So it wasn't just AJ Styles that TNA managed to see potential in straight away. Storm and Harris hit dives to the outside. Apparently these two Michaels brothers are not related, but if that's true, why do they look like twins? Storm hits a Hurricanrana, but he's stopped from making the tag, so then he hits an Inzaguri and brings Chris Harris in. Harris hits a crossbody from the top, but he can't get the free. James Storm has the match won, but the referee is distracted. Chris Michaels then hits the top rope leg drop whilst that's all going on, but he can only get a two for himself. Storm hits a super kick, but it's not the last call yet, so it doesn't end the match. The Michaels boys almost put Harris away, but he kicks out. Then Harris hits a catatonic that almost breaks the ring in half. This show's really lacking promos. They just can't get the balance right, can they? 
Storm and Harris get jumped by the hot shots who don't squeeze their junk. They are a team consisting of a cheap version of CM Punk and a depressed version of Shane Douglas. The beatdown goes on for a while, but it barely hurts them. Where have the 15 guys gone who were stopping Siaki and Lin from fighting earlier? It doesn't even make sense. It literally goes on for 5 minutes. What a waste of time. Straight into another match. Led by an albino Harry Potter, it's a young AJ Styles. Styles is so wacky and he's always dancing and bopping around. He'll be taking on the X Division champion, X Pack. I could have sworn they said this would be a ladder match on the last show. Maybe they thought three in a row was too many. Pack tries to shake AJ's hand, but he kicks it away. Styles is really cocky in the early going. You better be careful, or X Pack will kick that smile right off his face. AJ lands the first big move with the Hurricanrana. Pack looks really annoyed about it. It wakes him up, if anything. Styles has to keep hiding on the outside of his albino manager. In fact, his manager isn't afraid to get involved in the match. Styles charges and flips out the ring to take Pack out. The match is a lot more grounded than you would expect overall though. This move certainly wasn't. AJ hits a move I've never seen from him before as he hits a fame asser. Styles misses his spiral tap finisher and it allows Pat back in the match. He turns AJ inside out with one kick. Then he gets turned the other way with another kick. Pat then gets brought to an emergency stop as AJ catches him with a drop kick. AJ isn't the only one hitting big dives to the outside in this match as Pat proves that he isn't afraid either. Back in the ring, Six Pack almost wins with a Northern Light suplex. Then there's a discus ref bump. Pack hits the six factor, but Harry Potter gets in the ring to break up the pin. The ref is literally up seconds later. In fact, I've never seen a ref recover as quickly from an attack. Then Pack pushes the ref and he's disqualified. Oh, I didn't see that one coming. Pack is still the champion, so I don't know why he's so angry. Get over it. The second interview segment on this show this week is with Kurt Hennig. He talks about things that happened 20 years earlier. Tanae is kissing his ass again. It must be a nice change for him not being attacked and intimidated by the wrestlers. Just the main event now. The world title is on the line. It's the champion Ron the Truth Killings who cuts a promo complaining about TNA management as usual. He wants to give minority wrestlers title shots, but I guess that won't be happening tonight because the challenger is Kurt Hennig. He cuts a bad incoherent promo. We've seen this match before in Ring of the Hawk for Kurt's run, so I'll keep it brief and I'll knock out your teeth. Truth throws Henning into the commentary table and then sands him into the crowd. Henning randomly starts whacking him with a steel chair, although it was never classed as a no DQ match. Also, I don't want to hear people say, oh, it's TNA, there's an unwritten rule that weapons can be used. I've watched all 17 episodes so far, and no rule has ever been explained. Truth blinds Henning with something and hits him with a power slam. A lot of wrestlers come out to watch this one. Truth keeps kicking Henning upside down. Truth then does the splits, followed by the kicks, but it doesn't have much effect. Hennig hits a knee lift. Then we get one of the dumbest ref bumps you've ever seen. Hell, I've seen it before, so notice how I say you. A man in a white hoodie, Mr. Wrestling 3, starts attacking both Hennig and Truth. Then random wrestlers spill into the ring. Half man, half mold makes his way out to try and restore order. Once again, 15 men are in the ring. I hate this episode so much. Eventually all the wrestlers leave and the match gets restarted. Then there's a ref bump. Again. Truth doesn't want the match to restart, so he floors Borash and the Mold Man. This is the best thing to happen on the entire show. He then gets told that if he doesn't get back in the ring and defend the title, he'll lose the title by count out. Slap Nuts hits Hennig in the nutsack, and then Truth rolls him up for the free from a simple slap to the nuts. No good wrestling, no good or funny promos, and just a lack of energy on this show. It can shove it. Unfortunately, we're not done though yet, because apparently I like to torture myself for your pleasure. I've got another episode to watch yet. The second show starts with a five-way X Division match. It's Amazing Red, Kid Cash, the SATs and Elix Skipper. This one will be fight under Lucha Libre rules, whatever that means. I think it just means everyone's in the ring at once. As always with these matches, everyone starts diving to the outside. The SATs are famous for their really convoluted looking spots, so they don't let us down here. Who am I kidding? They're not famous. Kid Cash hits the Huracarana to the outside. I love it when he does that. Then he follows it up by springing off the table and hitting a DDT. The SAT almost puts away Amazing Red when he counters his dive into a powerbomb. Skipper shows his flexibility with a big boot to the face of an SAT. And then he nails the rope walk. Another lovely move. Elix Skipper's quality. Kid Cash then hits an incredible looking slam on Red from the top. He gets caught in the spotlight, seriously. Even the SATs are fighting each other in this one. You know, there's something seriously wrong with these SAT guys. They've literally got zero personality. I can't even tell them apart. Are they twins? Elix Skipper eliminates one of the SATs with the play of the day. Then he disappears off the screen as he flies through the air faster than the Hawk. 
Skip as the real MVP of this match. Then the SAT puts him away so it was a waste of time. Kid Cash nails the moneymaker to pin the SAT. I thought a moneymaker was a woman's ass. We are down to the final two now. Cash thinks he's got the match won with a double springboard dive but he can't manage the cover. Cash thinks he's got it won again with a move he calls the bank roll. This can also be associated with a woman's ass. This guy has so many moves. Cash hits another double springboard dive and Red kicks out again. This is getting ridiculous. Amazing Red then wins the match after hitting the infrared and he's now the number one contender for the X title. I wanted Cash to win. Backstage, Brian Lawler is looking through some doors. He says that he's sorry, can we please talk about this later? And Goldilocks looks at him like he spat at her. He was actually really polite. Tag title match next. It's the hot shots. They don't squeeze their junk though. Hey, I thought on the last video they were told that they were the bottom ranked team in TNA. How have they ended up in a tag title match? They take on Storm and Harris, but Storm doesn't get to use his cap guns because they all fight straight away. Storm is putting a belt to good use. Again, I didn't hear that this was a no DQ match. Everyone's fighting around the ring. Storm and Harris are having a pretty easy time of it here. There's a sign in the crowd that confused me saying, Cassidy feels the Raven effect. I know that he turned into his little minion a few years later, but was this guy predicting the future or something? Cassidy avoids the catatonic and hits a kick, but he can't win the match. James Storm then scores the 8 second ride. I genuinely forgot that this move existed. It's all going pretty well for Storm and Harris as they win again. Goldilocks is in the back interviewing Jerry Lynn who's moaning about his life as usual. Lots of insider terminology as usual. Then a giant face appears in front of the camera. Brian Lawler's such a goof. It's Don't Look At My Ass versus Jerry Lynn which starts straight away. This is billed as a grudge match. Lynn immediately has leg pain again so it's going to be a long night for him. They say that this is a recurring knee injury from his time in the WWF. Sonny puts on the half Boston. Lynn gets out of it and then stupidly hits a guillotine leg drop across the ropes. That old chestnut again. So now his leg's even more hurt so it's dumb. Siaki won't leave Lynn's leg alone but he can't make him give up no matter what he does. He starts driving Lynn's knee into the ground. This is a different sort of Jerry Lynn match to what I'm used to. Then out of nowhere Lynn rolls him up and bridges back for the free. Don't look at my ass as a bad loser so he continues the assault. And they brawl again just like the last show so I guess it's not over yet. Hennig and BG James are out next to cut a promo. Hennig looks really swollen here. He starts making fun of DDP and says that he tried to steal Perfect's gimmick. Then he goes on to make fun of Slap Nuts. Then he brings up the West Texas Rednecks and the crowd loudly cheer. He says that Jeff Jarrett copied him by trying to be a country singer. I think Jarrett had that first, didn't he? Hennig then tells the cameraman to zoom into his face. I don't think that's a good idea, Kurt. He starts talking about the plane ride from hell and how he took down Brock Lesnar at 35,000 feet. He tells Jarrett imagine what he'll do to him at ground zero. Slapnut's music is loudly playing but he doesn't come out. Slappy's in the back having an argument with Lawler who refuses to go out to the ring with him because he's waiting for his stupid girlfriend again. Nothing really happens. The one who looks like Elvis struts out to the ring next. He's been off for a few weeks taking care of some personal issues. This is said every time he comes out. Scott can't even talk properly, stumbling all over his words. I'm trying my best to be a good boy since I got here, and I'm sick and trying to tie him. I mean, sick and trying to... Anyway, something like that. He calls Slap Nuts out. Seems like everyone's after him tonight. This is apparently going to be a match, and out comes Slappy. This is already the third time this match has happened in TNA, and they both hold a victory over each other. So I guess you could say this is the decider. Hall hits the fall away slam, so Jarrett runs away. Paul then starts fighting him around the arena. As usual, they're using steel chairs for absolutely no reason. Slappy finally gets back in the ring and almost wins with a spinning netbreaker. Then there's a double down after Scott Hall hits the choke slam, and both men are completely spent. Then there's a ref bump because it's a Jeff Jarrett match. He whacks Hall with a chair, even though it didn't matter if the ref saw it earlier. Kurt Hennig then runs out and tries to stop him. Then there's a blackout, and Truth is in the back and threatens Kurt Hennig. Poor Kurt looks so confused. He's then jumped by Jerry's kid, but Mold Dog makes the save. Hennig kicks Jarrett in the nutsack. Hall tries to hit the razor's edge, but he can't manage it. He tries again, and this time he does manage it. Scott Hall's the winner of the match. Brian Lawler's out again. He's arguing with some teenagers in the crowd, but this time he's got a match against BG James. So we go from WCW Attitude Era matches to WWF Attitude Era matches. Lawler keeps stopping the fight to ask the crowd if anyone's seen his girlfriend April. James then drops Lawler overhead against the commentary table. It looks bad. Mike Tanay gets the table smashed into him in the process. Lawler's face swells up and he pulls a wacky face as BG hits him with a chair. Now it's time for the best part of the video again. 
Lawler fights with his arch nemesis, the chair boy, in the crowd. I love this. This time Lawler does manage to get the chair. Why does this keep happening and why is it always shown on camera? I wonder where this boy is nowadays. They finally get in the ring and Lawler hits a super kick. Suddenly Pac appears on the ramp lip locking April. Lawler starts shaking and he's screaming. He falls in his nutsack across the ropes. Oh god and BG pins him for the free. What a wacky way to end the match. BG James holds him back and stops him from interfering in the kissing. I did think poor Lawler but then I remembered that he apparently abused this woman. So it's not actually a bad thing. That was a good thing. Lawler's crying on the referee. This match was the highlight of the show for me. Oh, I never thought I'd get tired of watching wrestling matches. The albino Harry Potter brings AJ Styles out and he's going to face Pac for the belt again. But this time it's no DQ. Just like every match in TNA. Pac has the mic and tells the crowd they need to be quiet so he can cut his promo. <laughs> Pac says he thinks it's rubbish that the last match ended in a DQ. Potter's on commentary for this one. Pac takes a huge dive out of the ring to start the match. Back in the ring, Pac immediately kicks Styles down. The match is starting with a lot more intensity than the last one. Pac locks on the surfboard to perfection, but he has to break the hold as his shoulders are down. Styles manages to hit the spiral tap, but Pac strangely kicks out. Styles hits a power bomb out the corner and he tries to pin him with the bridge, but Pac muscles up and then he hits the X Factor straight away. It's still not over though because Harry Potter's yelling at Pac. Styles gets a two on a bridging German. Styles tries to hit the Styles Clash, but Pac makes the ropes. Then Lawler appears out of nowhere and smashes a bottle over Pac's head and AJ makes the pin. Game over. Styles is the new X Division champion. Then Pac randomly gets up and raises AJ's hand. What an idiot. How can he be happy with the way he lost the belt here? AJ hands the belt to Lawler behind his back who then floors him with the belt. <laughs> Who'd have thought that the first person to smash someone with a beer bottle in TNA would be Lawler? You thought it would be Storm. NWA Impact brings you the smack of the week. Sponsored by all new Blonde for Men. If you're a brown haired Potter, put some blonde in it. It makes you look hotter. And it's AJ Styles, man. He's looking for the Styles Clash. X Pac makes the ropes. X Pac makes the ropes. He's gonna get away from this. Wham! Brian Lawler with a bottle of this boy's down. This boy's down. Styles Clash. One, two, three. Game over for you. XP to the A to the C. That was the NWA TNA Smack of the Week. Sponsored by Blonde Just for Men. Get it? Got it? Shove it. Ace Steel out next. This guy looks like he's having serious issues. He's really unfortunate looking. He's taking on Jorge Estrada with Priscilla. She has a kick-ass body and a kick to the head face. As you can see, Jimmy Yang is in the Orient yet again, which is a real shame. I'm sorry, I can't really get into this match. I missed the wacky segments. This is proof that a balance of everything is best for business. Ace Steel hits a drop kick to the face from the top. Priscilla tries to block Ace Steel from attacking further so he throws her to the ground. The commentary team are going nuts complaining, but if you ask me, she deserved it. Jorge hits a DDT on the outside of the ring. He then comes back in the ring and misses a moonsault. Ace Steel does manage to hit his dive, but he does not bother making a pin. Ace Steel keeps almost getting the pin, but Jorge won't be beaten. Priscilla then trips Ace Steel up and the winner of the match is Jorge Estrada. The albino Harry Potter is annoyed that his guy lost and as is customary in NWA TNA, every match must end with a post-match beatdown. Pac is now out again. He's all over the show tonight. He's got a microphone again. He says that he only lost tonight because of Brian Lawler. Well obviously, we're not stupid you know. He says he can't help trying to hit on Lawler's girlfriend because April's hot. He tells Lawler to come out and settle it. Lawler does come out and he looks like someone's rubbed salt and vinegar crisps in his eyes. He's crying on the microphone and panting. <laughs> Please, okay? The fight's over. April, I don't want her. I don't want her anymore. She's used. She's a piece of trash. I saw you kiss her, and she kissed you back. Hey, you lost it. Very all she did. You just couldn't see any of the other stuff. <laughs> Then April runs out, she keeps saying that she loves him. Then she says that Pac drugged her. Wait, what? This is taking a drastic turn. Rape and drugged. He tells Pac he's gonna kill him and the fight is on. The nerds must be working overtime in this video with the amount of pull aparts that they've had to deal with tonight. I'm actually kind of looking forward to when they fight next week with April on the line. This crazy Brian Lawler gimmick's growing on me. Just the main event now for the world title, the champion Ron the Truth Killings versus Kurt Hennig. It's the same as their last main event. Truth hits the scissors kick but the match isn't over. Hennig is still fighting back with chops in the corner. 
Then he puts on the ankle lock, but Truth instantly makes the ropes. Hennig continues to do well with a back body drop, and then he launches him into the corner. Then Mr. Wrestling Free appears in the white hoodie of Doom. Hennig decides to put him in the ring, and he hits a running knee lift on him. Hennig tries to unmask him, but the Truth hits him with the brass knuckles, and the match is over. Why would Mr. Wrestling Free want Truth to be the champion? I'm pretty sure they never had an alliance once this reveal is done. And that's it for another week. I pretty much hated it, to be honest. There was hardly any good matches at all, and the highlight of the show is Brian Lawler. You know you're in trouble when Brian Lawler's the highlight of your show. Come on, TNA, you have to do better. Regardless of the season, I'll choke you with a sweater.